We're looking at heaven. We're looking at a through the eyes of John, if you will, as he's looked through the open door that God has given him. And he begins to see things and he shares what he sees because God told him to write. And so he writes down the things that he has viewed. And they're amazing things if you think about it. The sights that he see, that he's able to see. And, and he doesn't cover everything. It's, as you go through the revelation, you'll see more and I get a better view of of what heaven actually looks like with the golden streets and the gates of pearl and those type of things. He writes, and I gave a title tonight, is just keep looking, keep looking. And I think that's what we need to do in our hearts. Because we're getting a picture of heaven. And it's going to be a glorious day when we enter into that dwelling place where God lives. And we need to keep looking for Christ. We need to keep looking for His second coming. We need to keep, keep looking for the things we need to do as we wait here. And we need to keep looking. Because one day, we're going to leave this earth. If He doesn't come back, we get to go see Him. So just keep looking. You know what? as you begin to think about the people that actually got a glimpse into heaven, there are four people in the Bible that had some sort of view of heaven. You can read one of them, certainly everyone remembers Ezekiel. We've talked about Ezekiel a little bit, but you can start in chapter 1 of Ezekiel, and you'll get a picture of what he saw. Then you can go to Isaiah in chapter 6, right? And he got a picture of, of the king upon his throne and the angels that were singing. Paul also has a trip to heaven, but he doesn't say much about it. As a matter of fact, nothing other than he went. And then you get John and this revelation. So we come here and we look at this and we think about heaven. So who gets to go to heaven? That's the question, isn't it? Who gets to go to heaven? And so in the previous chapter, in verse 21, chapter 3, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So who gets, to over, who gets to go to heaven are those that overcame. We should be overcomers. We should hang on to Christ. We should live through this world in faith, putting our trust in him. And if we hang on and we strive and we fight for it, we overcome and we get to enter into the kingdom of heaven. John's looking through that open door. I mean, you can see things when you look in somebody's open door, can't you? You can ride down the streets, and the door might be open on a store, and you can look in, and you can see the different things they have for sale. There's so many things that you can see when you look through the open door. So the question is, what has John actually seen thus far? As so we begin in chapter 4, there's a few things that I want us to talk about it kind of in a way of re review. The first thing he saw was God was on his throne. He looks through that open door, and he sees God on his throne, which tells us that God is ruling and reigning. He is still in control, so John gets a view of that. Not only does he see that, but he sees the holiness of God as he sees them clothed in white because of the holiness, as he sees, and we're going to talk just a moment about that glassy sea, that's a part of the holiness of God. Not only does he see, see that, but he sees the rainbow around the throne, which reminds us of the grace that God's ha God has for us as he promised that there would be no more flooding. It tells us that he is long-suffering. The rainbow is that guarantee. Then we remember we talked a little bit about the 24 elders, which I believe represents the old saints, old, old covenant saints and the new covenant saints, the Old Testament saints and the New Testament saints. As they believe God, as they put their faith and trust in God, and regardless of whether they were looking forward to the cross or looking back at the cross, which we do, in faith they were able to overcome and enter into the kingdom of God. 
And we talked a little bit about the victor's crowns that the, he looked in and he saw. And these crowns were given to those that won the race, that prevailed, that overcame. And they received that victor's crown, and John is able to see that. And that's a glorious thing to see because it reminds us even today that if we overcome, we achieve what needs to be achieved, and we receive the same crown as they receive. We win the race. Last week we talked a little bit about angels, about how they were able to see and guard and watch over and take care of and how they were mighty and powerful. And so John looks through the door and he sees all this and he hears voices and he hears singing. He hears things that we can only imagine, if you will. So what is this that he's hearing and what is it that makes it so special as to what he is seeing? When you look at it, and go back to verse 8, and the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes round and within, and they do not rest day or night. When you begin to see that, and you begin to understand, when they say, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, you realize what he's really getting a glimpse of is the worship that's going on in heaven. I don't think we realize how much worship goes on in heaven. Because when you realize and you think about God creating man, it was with purpose. That he ha could have communion with man, but that he would also receive glory from man. And the best way to give glory to God is through worship. Worshiping God as creator, as all-powerful, as the giver of life and the sustainer of life. And John looks through that open door and he sees man and man is worshiping God. Fulfilling the role that man was created for to give God glory. Indwelling in every person born in this world is a desire to worship. We are going to worship something. Christians worship God. We realize that God is worthy of worship, so we humble ourselves before Him, and we give Him the praise and honor that is due His name. Not everyone does that, but everyone worships something. They may worship false gods. They may worship themselves. They may worship sexual immorality. They may worship their possessions. They may worship their knowledge. Everyone will worship something. We worship God. And so I want you to see the progression of worship. I want you to think about that. There is a progression to worship. And the progression of worship is, begins with someone like Moses who comes into contact with God at the burning bush and immediately realizes that there's something special and he comes to see and God tells him to take off his shoes because he's standing on holy ground. Worship begins when we want to see God and when we want to be around God, but there are certain things that are required. And so tonight, in these verses, we're going to see that progression of worship. The angels sing. Notice verse 8 again at the end. They call God holy, holy, holy. They call Him Lord, and they call Him Almighty. And these are characteristics of God that will move us to worship. But notice the last part of the verse that they sing. It tells us who God is, who was and is and is to come. Well, who is this? The God that was represents God in the past. As he dealt with man, as he created man, as he created this world, he is the God of the past. 
But he's not a dead God. He's not just in the past. He is. He's the present. He is with us here tonight. He watches over us everywhere we go, and he sees everything we do. He is worthy of worship because he knows who we are by name. He knows every hair on our head. He knows every thought that enters into our minds and our hearts. He is, he is, and he is worthy of worship. And so the progression begins to build. Once you realize who he is or who he was, and that he is still that same God today, and you begin to realize in your heart and your mind, as you look to the future, to our hope and our dwelling place, we begin to understand that he is to come. He is the God of the future as well. Regardless of what you think. You know, I, I talked to a lot of our senior adults over the past couple of weeks, I guess. And just about every one of them has told me the same thing. It's getting harder to get up. I had a couple, and I'm not talking about y'all. If, if you made this statement, I'm not going to call your name. I can remember when I was 20 years old, and I can do anything I wanted to. But now here I am, and they're older than I am, and we just, I can't hardly get up out of a chair anymore. Now, have y'all ever said that? The God that watched over you when you were 20, is the God that watched over you when you were 40. And he is the God that's going to watch over you as long as you live. And he's going to take you by the hand and lead you to the promised land. He is the God of our future. John sees this and John hears this and John is thinking about the wilderness experience. You just know he is. He thinks back to when his ancestors had a God that created them. He thinks back to the stories that he's, he's heard about, the real events that happened in the Old Testament. He thinks about the Genesis account, the patriarchs. He comes into the law and he remembers that great wilderness experience and all the accounts that were written about the presence of God who was with them. And he knows that God is still with them. Hey, God is with John at this day. And God has looked at, and John has looked into heaven and he sees God and he knows God is going to be there in the future. That begins to cause us to worship. We have a God that's been here forever and ever and ever. And we have a God that's going to be here in the future forever. And he's going to take care of us. And it ought to move us to worship. To worship. Who was and is and is to come. I want you to see the second part of the progression of worship. It is the nature of worship. Worship builds. Every day that God is invested in your life should cause you to want to worship Him more. Your experience in worship should change as you grow in faith. Your praise that you give God should be more from the heart each day you live. There should be something that God does in your life that causes you to humble yourself, to fall down before God, and to worship Him more and more every day. It is a progression. God loves you, and God is watching over you. God is meeting your needs. He's sustaining your life. He causes you to take a breath every time you breathe. And it ought to move you to worship a God that loves you enough. He will keep you breathing. You know, they don't understand. They understand that there's an electrical pulse in your body, right? Y'all know that? That's why a shark can find you in water. He goes to the electricity. And he can find you because of that electrical pulse. The problem is they don't know where it comes from. 
There's no generator in your body, right? But it's there. How did it get there? God put it there. How does it keep working? God causes it to work. And one day, if Christ doesn't come back, God's going to stop it. And he's going to take you home. And we ought to praise God for the very life that we have. Notice in verse 10, uh, and look at it with me. The 24 elders fall down before him. They fall down. We started out with angels, right? And so the angels were there in heaven before man was created. And there was a great battle that went on. And the angels were separated. And the, the evil angels were cast out of heaven. Man was created. So the angels were worshiping God. And now it begins to expand as man is created. We see the 24 elders. We see the, the saints of the Old Covenant or the Old Testament. And we see the saints of the New Testament. Those that have come in faith. And they are beginning to to worship God with the angels. Verse 9 says, Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, verse 10, the 24 elders then begin to fall down before Him who sits on the throne and worship Him. They worship Him. They fall down and worship. Not only do they fall down before Him and worship Him, who lives forever and ever, but they cast their crowns before the throne. Did you ever wonder where the music, isn't it a group called Casting Crowns? Did you ever wonder where they got their name? Right there. They cast their crowns. What they, strive, they have been striving for, the battles that they fought to endure, to overcome, to be counted worthy, to win the race Paul talks about, to win the boxing match that Paul talks about. They receive the crown, they get to heaven, worship starts, and they realize, and we will realize, that if it was not for God, we would not have overcome, we would not have the crown. And so the crown really belongs to God. And they take the crown off that God has given them, and they give it back to Him. For He is worthy. Our God is worthy. If you take nothing else away from here tonight, you hold to the thought that the God that saved you is worthy of your worship. He's worthy of every essence of your being. He is worthy of all the praise that you can give Him for your whole life and all eternity. He is a worthy God. Give Him your very best and give it to Him while you can. Worthy. He is worthy. Casting the crowns. I want you to notice not only the nature of worship, but now notice the words of worship. are worthy, creator, and sustainer. Verse 11 says, Lord, you are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy, O Lord, and you are worthy to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created, he is the creator, all things. And by your will, they exist and were created. By God's very will, He sustains the life that is on this earth. He created and He sustained it. What does it take? I want you to look at this with me. The biblical characteristics of worship 
I'm talking about God's characteristics that make him worthy of worship. Turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 2. I know you've all heard a sermon on 2 Samuel. Right? Go on and say, if, if I was here, if you were here when I was here before, you heard a sermon on 2 Samuel because I preached it. There is a lady. Her name is Hannah. And Hannah wanted a child. But she could not have a child. Maybe it's 1 Samuel. Let's look at 1 Samuel. Let's try that. 1 Samuel chapter 2. I don't know why I did that. You go and you begin to look at the whole chapter... In chapter 2, and Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord. There is none beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. Something brought on this praise. She had wanted that child. And she petitioned God to give her a child. And he pro she promised she would give that child back to God. And so the child was born. And her heart begins to pour out. And it continues to pour out. In 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 20, And Eli would bless Elican and his wife and said, The Lord give you descendants from this woman for the loan that was lent to the Lord. Then they would go to their own home. And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the child Samuel grew before the Lord. What brought on all that praise was that God answered her prayers. God met her at her point of need, and she did not take it for granted. The problem with the modern-day Christian is we take God provision for granted. We just live through life. We never stop and we never really begin to focus on what God is doing for us each and every day of our life. Hannah needed that son. Her husband had two wives and the other wife had given her children and she despised Hannah and made Hannah feel like a second class citizen so Hannah went to God's man and he began to pray, and she prayed, and she made a covenant. And God blessed her. And when that blessing came upon her, her heart overflowed, and she began to praise God and gave him glory. I want you to think about that. Has God blessed you? Where you are today, has God blessed you? Has God met your needs? Has God given you a place to rest? Has God given you all that you need and more? How much do you return to God in worship? How much worship do you give God? What are the characteristics that cause us to worship God? Number one is holiness. You can go to Psalms, you can go many places in the scriptures, but it tells us that God is holy. And he's worthy. He's worthy. Psalms, Psalms is a good example. All through the Psalms, I just wrote down one for you to read and look up. He is worthy because he is a holy God. So much that Peter says, be holy as your God which is in heaven is holy. And, and Jesus said, be ye perfect as your Father is perfect. So we understand that God is holy, and because He is holy, He is worthy of worship. He's also worthy because of His power. In Genesis chapter 17, how powerful is God? We read all the, the stories about God in the Scriptures. A lot of times we take them just as stories, but they're real life events. And in Genesis 17, and when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. 
God says, I am almighty. He is a powerful God. He parted the Red Sea. People in my Sunday school class, how many times was the Jordan River parted? Three, right? Y'all know that, right? God allowed, God parted the Jordan River for the children of Israel, for Elijah and Elisha. He parted the Red Sea. He put Jonah in a whale. He controls the whales. He stops the sun. How powerful is your God? Is he worthy of worship? What can God do? What can God not do? Because of his power, he is worthy of all the worship we can give him. He's also able. How able is your God? Do you believe God can do what he said he'll do? Do you really believe God can do what he says he can do? I believe it. I, I believe everything in the Bible. There's nothing in the scriptures that I don't believe. Why? Because I, I've, I've taught through Hebrews, I've read Hebrews, and look at Hebrews with me. There's two verses I wrote down. It just talks about his character. Hebrews 2.18 It says, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able, you get it? He is able to aid those who are tempted. He can help you if you're tempted. Why do we fall to temptation? Because we don't turn to him who is able to help us with that temptation. Then look at chapter 7 and verse 25. This may even be better. Therefore, he is also able to do what? To say, to the what? To the what? Uttermost? Is that, is, what is the uttermost? Have you ever thought what the uttermost is? More than you can imagine. Further than you can believe. More than you can ever put in your mind the thought how far God can save, he can save you to more than you can ever imagine to the uttermost. God is able. He is able to save. He's able to overcome temptation. Go through the scriptures and do a word study of the word able. He is an able God. He's able to part the seas and calm the storms. He is able to heal the blind and the lame. He is an able God. Is he able to meet your needs? If so, is he worthy of worship? That's the question. Do you believe he's worthy of worship? You know, we could go through the scriptures. and We can find, I don't know how many places that it talks about people worshiping God. You can go to the Old Testament and you talk about the, the worship that uh, Abraham went up on the mount to offer his son. You can talk about the first worship, the first altar. You can talk about the worship throughout the Old Testament and how they would go to the tabernacle and finally move to the temple. You get to the New Testament and you, you do the research and you'll find out that they were offering hundreds of thousands of sheep in worship at the Passovers. And, and it's just a tremendous amount of worship and what would cause people to worship God like that? Is because they had a history with God. They looked back over their long life of, of the nation of Israel and they realized God was always involved. Is he involved in your life? Let me answer it for you. He is. And if he's involved in your life, he is worthy of the worship that you ought to give him. Chapter 4 gave us a little, go to the next slide, gave us a little insight into heaven. Chapter 4 is not the whole book on heaven, right? It's just a little glimpse through the door. If you ride by something on the road, a house, and they have the front door open, and you look in, you can see a bit of it. 
but you don't get to see the, 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 the kitchen or you don't get to see the bedrooms or the bathrooms. You get to see just what you can see through that door. And John got a glimpse of heaven and it moved him. And it gave him a reinforced understanding that he needed to write down what he saw so that we would know. And he gets to see more and more of it. We're going to stop in chapter 4. We're going to go into the Old Testament for a little bit. and Then we're coming back because we need the background. Okay? You have faith in Christ? Where did faith first begin? It began in the Old Testament. And we're going to study it. Okay? You have any questions? Any comments? Y'all ready to go home? Nobody ready to go home? I'll preach some more. Hold on. Y'all stay.